Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the JC West Podcast. This is episode number 232, dedicated to a college this time, who on January 27th, 1894, played in the very first college basketball game. The University of Chicago beat the Chicago YMCA 19 to 11. And as always, I want to thank you for listening and downloading another episode of the podcast. On today's episode, a little special bonus episode featuring an interview with Trey Dimps from the Big Ten Network. If you've been around for the podcast for a while, you know there used to be two episodes a week, and then we had to go back down to one episode a week. This past Monday, there was no episode. Jay was sick, and Jay took that day off. Luckily, when he was sick, there was football to watch all weekend, so I would just lay it up on my couch, watching the football, enjoying it with you, like you. But now I am back feeling amazing right now, way better than I was on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and even Monday of last week or Monday of this week now. And so we're back. But we're going to start having some bonus episodes. Every now and then, there will be some interviews, an athlete, former athlete, a current athlete, a coach, maybe uh, somebody in the media. We'll just have that be a bonus episode. Nothing consistent. Maybe a couple times a month we'll come in, have an interview, uh, change things up just a little bit, get a perspective of someone that you might not normally hear from, and just have them be in the space of this here podcast. Today, Trey Demps played at Northwestern, um, also played overseas for a little bit, currently a college basketball analyst for the Big Ten Network. Phenomenal, phenomenal young man. Love talking to him. You have to wait and hear his story about the time that he scored a game winner on LeBron James. I'm going to back away. I'm going to bring in Trey Demps and just sit back, relax, and enjoy this fun interview as Trey Demps tells his story about his journey playing basketball. And joining us now here on the Jay Stevens podcast is a former Northwestern Wildcat basketball player, also played overseas for a few years, and now he is a college basketball analyst on the Big Ten Network. It is Trey Demps. Trey, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. How about yourself? I'm doing very well, very well. I was looking back through some things about you preparing for this interview, and I noticed that your upbringing was different than maybe the average child. Not only did your dad play professional basketball, but you moved around quite a bit. What was that upbringing like for you? Yeah, I mean, for sure, man. Like, definitely basketball was kind of the centerpiece of our of our household. Um, when I was young, my dad was overseas. So I didn't see him a ton. You know, he was doing his thing overseas. And then he retired when I was, I want to say seven. Okay. And so, um, you know, after he retired, I got to see him a lot more. And, you know, just being around him, being around the game, you know, definitely influenced me, right? I remember um when I was like six or seven you know I went to a, a a pickup game that he was playing in and kind of from there you know watching him play shooting on the side I actually still remember to this day that was kind of the moment where I was like yo I really want to pursue this and be you know just like my dad and so um yeah you know he lived in California after he retired and so he was a scout for a while so I would travel with him to games as he was scouting you know he scouted a lot of like pack uh, Pac-10 games. Okay. Um, so he was a scout for the Knicks and the Spurs for a while, like when I was in elementary, middle school. So I would go to games. And so, you know, just being around him, you know, getting that quality time, being around the game, it definitely, definitely influenced me in, uh, you know, pursuing to be a basketball player myself. You mentioned something, a well, a little bit ago when you were talking about how there was like that one moment where everything clicked. What in that moment went through you? I know it's a long time ago. But yeah. What in that moment kind of do what do you remember about what clicked in your head at that point in time? So I was so my dad was playing pickup. I was, I think I was six. It was a little bit before he retired. And I was shooting on the side goal and I couldn't make a shot. Like I was just trying for like the whole time he was playing, probably 90 minutes or so. And so I finally at the end, like right before we uh left finally made a shot and just that feeling that gratification mm -hmm. I think you know that feeling of like working towards something right and practicing and persisting I think even at a young age it really kind of inspired me 
Um, and then I told my dad I wanted to be on a team. He got me on a team. And so, yeah, from there, the rest is kind of history. What do you remember from, if anything, from your dad, his teammates, um, just kind of stories yeah. your dad told you as a kid that maybe kind of helped you and be the basketball player that you that you have been? You know, nothing in particular stands out. My dad was always great about just getting me around the right people, mm -hmm. I would say, and just getting me around kind of the culture of high-level basketball. I think what a lot of fans don't understand, there's there's a culture that comes with high-level basketball, right? Like, it's it's not just a, a hobby, it's a lifestyle. And uh, just kind of being around that lifestyle uh, was just really, you know, I, I fell in love with it, right? Just being around, you know, I met Greg Popovich, I think, when I was 10. Okay. Um, met Tim Duncan around that same time as well. Met a lot of great coaches, uh, personnel. So, like, just, you know, talking to them, being around the game, being at the games, being kind of in the um, – in, like, the, you know, the backstage, you know, and seeing all the people who works, you know, the media, the, the coaches, you know, all the people, all the personnel. I think, you know, I just – just that environment, you know, just felt like home for me from a young age. You mentioned something about the culture of high-level basketball, and I know there are people listening to this or maybe watching where they say, no, nah, Trey, there's no different culture for high-level <laughs> basketball. But you've played it, not only high-level in college, but also high-level professionally overseas, not only from your dad, but you've seen firsthand that culture that is of high-level basketball. Could you take some time to describe what that culture is? Man, that you know, that's, that's a great question. I think that's a great question. I would say – you know, it's funny, right? Because my wife was a basketball fan. And then when she married me, she very, very quickly realized, like, this is a culture and a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Like, and she needs to, ex at times, to escape. Like, I, I can't watch basketball right now because it's so just kind of ingrained into, you know, your world. And so I think that's, that's the biggest thing. Because as a fan, you're... You go to your job, nine to five, it's something outside of sports. And then it's kind of a leisure activity for you to engage with basketball, right? Mm -hmm. You watch a game, you watch Stephen A. Smith, blah, 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 whatever it is. But, you know, when you are in the culture, right, from the moment you wake up, you know, even as an analyst now, I'm looking up stats of Big Ten teams, players, you know, when I was playing, you know, I'd go to practice, then I watch film, and then, you know, I might go watch uh, uh, an NBA guy. So it's just like it's ingrained into your everyday uh, routine, and so I think that's that's kind of the biggest difference of it being a culture versus just kind of being a leisure and hobby type of thing. I feel you there, and I do think that the average person they don't fully understand because even myself, like I don't fully understand what that culture is high-level basketball, well, what you played. I, I've watched it my whole life. I've talked to players like yourself. But until you're living that day by day, you mentioned it so well, your wife kind of realized quickly this is different. This isn't just like the leisure word that you used earlier, a recreation. This is a lifestyle. People talk about the health lifestyle or you're, you're a gym rat, you're in the gym working out all the time. But gym rats also in basketball. And I think a lot of guys, they hear all these stories like, oh, man, that's funny. Or some people may say, oh, that's cute. No, this is literally a lifestyle. And that right. culture of high-level basketball, that's why the greats are the great, because they understand the culture and they live it every single day. Yeah, you think about the late, great Kobe Bryant, right? I think he's he was the best at, like, kind of outlining how it's a lifestyle and culture, right? How early he woke up to go work out before his practice, you know, he's going on uh, private planes to go back home to take his kids to school after he got a workout in, you know what I mean? So it's like, that, that's the type of stuff, like the sport comes first, you know what I mean? That's the first thing you're thinking about and doing. And, you know, it takes a toll on family members, right? Like, I, yeah, it's just, it's just funny, man, because, you know, I see on social media people bashing athletes. Like, people don't really understand, like, the time, the effort, the sacrifice that these athletes at all levels, collegiate and professionally, are putting in to try to be the best. You know what I'm saying? So 
that that that's the that's like the biggest thing, man. It's just you know understanding that and then having an appreciation for the athletes. You know, you're talking about understanding that, and it seems like you had a somewhat of an appreciation or understanding at a younger age. Of course, that grew as you got older. But as you got older, you're trying to figure out where you want to play college basketball. You played, I believe you played high school ball one year in Cali and then the rest, I believe, in San Antonio. But then you kind of had to make a decision about where you're going to play collegiately. You had a few offers. Ultimately, you landed, landed at Northwestern. Why did you choose the Wildcats? Yeah, so um, yeah, so I played my first year. So growing up, the first 14, 15 years of my life, I lived with my mom mm -hmm. in California in the Bay Area. And so my dad lived in Sacramento, and then he got the job at the San Antonio Spurs um, in the front office, not just as a scout. And so after my freshman year, I moved with my dad, you yeah. know, kind of with the, the, the mindset of, you know, ha being around him more often, being around the Spurs facility to get me ready for that next level. And so I was under-recruited. Um, you know, I didn't play on, like, big AAU teams. That was kind of around the, around, around the time, like, 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. where the, kind of the grassroots, the 90s, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff really started to – be prominent, but I didn't play on one of those big Nike, Adidas teams. And so because of that, I was under-recruited. And a lot of times, you know, when I would play during the live period when college coaches would be there, there weren't a ton of scouts, you know, at our games or at my team's games. And so um, it wasn't really until I was able to, I mean, I'll be honest, like I went to the LeBron camp. I probably wasn't good enough to go, but just kind of the, the connections that my dad had was able right. to go. Right. Um, but I played really well. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't have known that I was kind of like a favor, so to speak. And so from there, things kind of changed. You know, I got a, a ton of, uh, I wouldn't say a ton, but I got a handful of high major offers, um, you know, had some schools that I had never heard of or thought of heard of, thought that I would heard of um, reach out to me. And, uh, you know, I kind of just went with the first school that showed me the most interest mm -hmm. and really wanted me the most in Northwestern. And obviously academically, um, it's second to none uh, in terms of, you know, one of the top schools in the Midwest and in the country. So that was kind of the thing, you know, they told me that I'd have an opportunity to play right away. Um, you know, I felt comfortable on campus and ultimately decided to go there. Your freshman year, we talked about this last week when we were on Locked on Buckeyes, you had an injury and mm -hmm. I believe it what you end up redshirting your freshman year. A lot of guys mentally, that messes them up. A lot of guys mentally, and it's just the human nature, it, human element. You play the sport your entire life. You get there. You're playing college ball. You think you can, you can play at this level. You play four games. And then ultimately, Trey, you ended up getting hurt, redshirted that whole year. What did that do to your mind during that time period when you couldn't play basketball? Yeah, that's a great question. So I actually hurt my shoulder the summer going into my freshman year. It's a funny story. I was playing in L.A. Um, you know, my dad had me out there kind of playing against some of the pros and I was playing against Reggie Jackson every okay. day, uh, current Clippers guard. And, um, you know, there was this day, man, he was just tearing me up. I mean, yeah. actually, yeah. I, you know, sometimes I would hold my own. Sometimes he would tear me up. But this day he was just tearing me up. And I was just getting frustrated. And, you know, he was scoring on me in all different ways. <clears throat> and so we're doing this one-on-one -on -one drill. And he's coming at me. And he, he gets by me, and I just stick my hand out. So I was just like, you know, I just kind of try to foul him intentionally, and I just heard my shoulder pop. Ooh. And so I was like, oh, shoot. Right. And wasn't able to play the rest of the day. Um, you know, I called my dad, and, you know, we got the MRIs, tore my labrum. And so that's kind of one of those injuries where you kind of have to make a decision um, in terms of you can play with it mm -hmm. or you can get surgery. And so we elected to for me to try to play with it. Um, I get back to campus maybe a month and a half later. Not the same player. You know, a lot of it is on the defensive end. You can't really bang. You know, you're you're guarding it a lot. 
And so I actually ended, I still ended up starting my first game. I got to give Northwestern credit. They kind okay. of offered that promise in terms mm-hmm. of me, you know, playing right away. Wasn't very good, uh, to say the least. And um, ultimately got out of the rotation. And then, you know, it was kind of the best thing to utilize that medical red shirt. But, yeah, it was tough, you know, because as a competitor – that was kind of the first time that I had quote unquote failed. And, you know, it was a lot to process. It was a lot to kind of internalize. And it was, yeah, it was, it was hard. It was hard. It was a tough year not being able to play. Um, but, you know, I, I think it got me better. Uh, I think it grounded me, you know, obviously through that time, you know, kind of, uh, became a Christian and, and realized there was more to life than basketball because my life was so encompassed in basketball. Um, and so, yeah, I, ultimately I look back at that time and, and, and really thankful because I think it grounded me and made me more of a uh, diverse person. I'm going to circle back to something you just said, kind of try to figure out if there's a way or if there was a player you kind of got the best of at some time. You mentioned Reggie Jackson. What other NBA players or if was there an NBA player that you got the best of at some time? Maybe not the entire scrimmage, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, there's those times when, like, you're in college, he's older, you're trying a little bit harder, and you get him on a certain play or you get him on a certain move. Was there an NBA player that you got at some point? Oh, man, I've never told this story publicly. Okay. I told it privately. So I've scored a game winner on LeBron James. Ooh. It's my claim to fame. My claim to We got to hear about this. Yep. So I'm at his camp. Um, I am a, this was, oh, this is the camp I reference. Uh, okay. I kind of got some momentum and some recruiting. Um, so LeBron comes, this is actually right before the decision. Ooh, um, okay. Okay. 2010. 2010. Correct. And so he's playing, you know, with the kids that are at the camp. So there's a college one and then there's a high school one. And mm-hmm. so he kind of had a group of five and like, we're kind of rotating, you know, playing different teams. And we were the first team to play LeBron's team. So I think it was LeBron, Jamario Moon, uh, Daniel Gibson. I'm not gonna lie, I don't remember the other two players, but it was his, his current Cavs teammates. And so it's me, uh, i trying to think if there's any NBA, Kyle Anderson was on my team. Okay, okay. Um, Jabari Brown, who was a former Laker. And I can't remember exactly who else was on my team. But, you know, we had some good players, good high school players. And so we're playing pickup. You know, we get off to a hot start. We're playing a five, just quick games of five. We get off to a quick start. We go up like 4-0. You know, Bron scores like three, four buckets in a row. And... Um, you know, there's a rebound we miss, and Bron tries to outlet it quick to Booby Gibson, and I intercept the pass, and so I'm coming down. He comes up. I'm about to pull it from three, and see, so he sees me about to pull it from three, so I hesitate. I go to the rim, shoot a quick floater, game. <laughs> <laughs> I see why that story stayed private. I understand it now because that's the kind of story once it gets out, you it might get back to LeBron, and then that's one of those things where it's like, hey, youngster, we got to go do this again. We're not going to let, let this be uh, the story you tell about me for the rest of my life. <laughs> right. No, so it's a real story. I mean, listen, I'm not making that up. It happened. You know, well, we didn't play. We didn't play four quarters. Obviously, we got blown out the water if we had played four quarters. We played quick game to five, pickup game. Hey, our team won. It happens. So you ended up coming back. It would have been your red shirt freshman year at this point. You ended up coming back that, that year. And then that was the final year for Bill Carmody. I think I said his name correctly. Yep. That was his last year, 2012, 2013, his last year at Northwestern. The next year, Chris Collins comes in. Now, I don't want to go through, like, the whole coaching process, like how you thought, who you thought should have been there. That, that's, to me, not the better story. Mm-hmm. We're in an era, era right now where college basketball players, college athletes can move freely. One time, imme- one time transfer, um, no sit out. You can, you're immediately eligible. And in this time, you still could have, I believe you still could have transferred. You still would have had to sit out one year. I believe that was the rule back then. Did you ever consider transferring when there was a coaching change? Because I know a lot of players, we see it all the time. They want to leave because their coach isn't there anymore. But you live this. Was there ever a thought in your mind to leave Northwestern once the, once there was a coaching change? 
Well, there's a few things. So I would registered it already. So I think I would, have, I would have lost a year of eligibility. Right. Had I and I would have only been able to play college basketball for three years had I transferred. So right there, it was kind of already kind of impossible for me with the rules at that given time for me to transfer. Um, but the other thing, too, was, I mean, I'll be honest, you know, I really respected uh, Bill Carmody, the person, and just I thought he was a really good guy. But obviously on the court, we just didn't see eye to eye. You know, I was more of a player that liked freedom, you know, pick and rolls. You know, he his system was very uh, structured. It was a Princeton offense, a lot of back doors, um, a lot of moving without the basketball. Um, so it just wasn't a good fit, you know, which is fine. And so when he uh, was let go, you know, from my perspective, it was kind of more so an opportunity to kind of start over and get a clean slate. And so when Chris Collins got the job, you know, I, I knew that we had similar backgrounds. Both of our dads were, you know, obviously highly, his dad, obviously more, was highly acclaimed in the basketball world. Uh, my dad at the time was a GM. Um, so it, it, it kind of was like a great fit from the jump. And we both look, we're basketball junkies and love the game, right? And so I think we clicked right away um, when he came in. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I ended up having a good sophomore year and uh, a really successful career. So, you know, I still to this day have a great relationship with Coach Collins. Um, you know, it's actually even hard for me to go on the network and talk about Northwestern just because of how close I am with the program still. Um, but yeah, it, it actually worked out great for me personally just because it was just a different regime different philosophy, a lot more freedom, pick and rolls. Um, he just, at the end of the day, Coach Collins just cared if you, if you love the game. If you mm -hmm. love the game and you are competitive, you had an opportunity to have success with him. You know, Trey, I think a lot of athletes and even just people in general can learn a lot about the things that go on in sports, the coaching changes. Do you leave? Do you not leave? In your situation, you already redshirted, so you knew you would have lost a year of eligibility. You would have only been able to play for three years if you ended up transferring after the coach was gone. And right. I think sometimes, even like myself included, we try to jump ship. We try to not learn the lessons that are that, were, that are right in front of us for us to learn because somebody, something, somebody leaves our life or somebody leaves our family or um, somebody at work looks at, looks at us the wrong way or the right. boss keeps giving us all the bad jobs. And we sometimes, I say we because myself included, we look at all the bad and we're like, oh, no, no. I want to just go Leave the, leave the situation, go somewhere else, not try to learn anything else. And I think, Trey, for you, not just in basketball, but even as an analyst for the Big Ten Network, there are probably some lessons you learned during that time period, during that transition, that you kind of remember and you utilize not only at Northwestern, not only playing overseas, but even now as an analyst, you're, those lessons kind of stick with you for the rest of your life. Absolutely. And yeah, I don't want to sound like an old head. I feel like a lot of old heads are like, back <laughs> in my day, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I think ultimately it's it's your why. Like, why are you leaving the current situation that you're in, right? I think that you have to look at yourself in the mirror first before you jump ship or before you decide to transfer. And unfortunately, I don't think a lot of student athletes do that. And then what I've seen actually is a lot of student athletes transfer and then they go to the school and they do even worse. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why don't you just stay? You know what I mean? And so and I think a lot of those situations is like, why did you leave? And did you look at yourself in the mirror first? Like when I kind of went through my hardships early on at Northwestern, that's what I did. I looked at myself in the mirror and was like, look, I am not, one, I'm not a good defender. And that might not ever change, but I have to at least be, a guy that can guard my man a little bit. Right. On the other end, for not being a great defender, I'm not good enough offensively. So I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, look, I have to be more efficient. I have to be better. Um, and I have to take ownership in that. Yeah. And then after that, if you do those things 
and then there's just not a, a, a connection or click with the program, then, of course, then you transfer and then – but if you just transfer off the jump just because there's some hardships or difficulties, I think it's, it's problematic and, you know, the grass is not greener on the other side. As a former player, I'm curious, and I know you're still kind of you're plugged in with the Big Ten and Northwest and other other schools there. Um, Dave Rebs and Andy Katz and those guys that are on the Big Ten network. Yeah. Do you think what the trend we're seeing right now is something that will last, or is it something where you think it's just going to be something that it's here right now? Five years from now, players will not be transferring as frequently as quickly as they are. Uh, you know, I think the NCAA has to do something. You know, I don't mean to cut you off. I've heard a lot of people say that. Not just like people like podcast hosts like myself. Former mm -hmm. players are saying the NCAA needs to do something. And I find it interesting that you immediately say that after I ask that question. Yeah, because, you know, right now, I, I think with that particular thing, I, yeah. not overall, I think there's too – the players have too much autonomy. And then I think it, it just, you know, a player can just go to another school right away I think that you got to put like some kind of waiver, right? So like if you're if a kid is at a school and there's a, a mutual agreement that it's not the best fit for the the player and the and the program, the basketball program, then maybe like you sign that agreement and then you don't have to sit out that one year. But I think if at any point from both sides because a lot of times what people don't understand too is like Coaches force players out too. Yeah, they that's do. something that's. So I think there has to be some sort of like mutual agreement. So like in the, in the case of a, of a, and I know a few uh, situations personally where a coach has had a meeting with the player, and then they kind of initiated them to transfer. Mm -hmm. I feel like the player in that situation should have the right to say, you know what. I you, you, I signed a scholarship here. I should I should be able to stay here. Or in that situation, like they don't have to sit out a year if the coaches are are kind of forcing their hand, forcing them out the door. I don't know. It, it's something I'm glad I'm not a decision maker in that situation because you know it's not a it's not an easy thing. You know, obviously I know the NCAA gets a ton of flag, um, and that's just you know. Something I try to just stay out of, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, but, I, yeah, I just think there has to be some sort of mutual agreement because otherwise, right now, the way things are, man, it's just like, I mean, I don't know how many kids transferred. It's like, I think there was like, per team, there's three to four transfers per team on average. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. I've heard that football is bad, bad. High numbers in football for transfers, high numbers in basketball for transfers, volleyball. I mean, sports you don't even think about. People are just freely moving. I don't know, man. I don't know if the NCAA is going to make any changes now, five years from now, um, next week. I, I, I don't know. I, I have no idea what their plans are. I do think they get a lot of negative public publicity. Um, too much to me, just to be honest with you. I think the NCAA does a phenomenal job allowing athletes like yourself to play collegiately. I mean, think about it. If the, if the NCAA didn't do that, they, I mean, if they did, but they didn't, they weren't as buttoned up in certain areas. An athlete like yourself may not have a chance to work at the, at the Big Ten Network because what happened while you're playing a sport that the NCAA runs, if that doesn't go well, then it's like, well, connect, connections you may have with family and things like that. But then also, your playing career might not be one where the network is like, man, you weren't a good enough player. We want to bring on players that were actually decent or did a little bit. You weren't really that kind of player. And, yeah, I know the NCAA kind of hurts you, but you got to try to overcome those obstacles to me, Trey, just to be personal, I think the NCAA and the negative publicity that it gets is too much. They do a lot of good. I mean, the NCAA tournament, for instance, for college basketball, it's one of the most exciting times of the year. One little hiccup, everybody blows up. I'm like, wait, so you got 68 teams, all these sites, all everything going on, then all of a sudden, one little hiccup, the NCAA is the worst organization in the world. Let's just back it up. To me, back it up a little bit and realize, like, the NCAA really isn't all as all that bad. All as bad, Trey, as people say that it is. Yeah, I, th I think two things can be true. I think that's like kind of the phrase that I think of. I, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. I think that, like you said, like I wouldn't have this opportunity, you know, as an analyst hadn't I played in the Big Ten to work for the Big Ten Network. I 100% I 
agree with it. And I think, like you said, like they, they have done a lot of good. And there's there's a lot of good people that yes. work for the NCA and have good intentions, right? Even, I mean, I think the intentions with the transfer rule, you know, because of COVID and um, with everything, I think that had good intentions. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, I think here's here's what I've what I've always stood by, right? Is the fact that you know the 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 players don't get compensated. You know, there's this yeah. big pot of money and the players get nothing. I think that's kind of the the biggest issue. What I think they should do, and I think they can do, is that I believe they can pay the players the like whatever the 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 salary mm -hmm. of a normal American person mm -hmm. in that city or whatever, just pay him that. If you just pay him that, right, then all of a sudden they have what they need and then they're able to, you know, function in a way that they can provide for themselves, have a healthy life, you know. So, like, let's say you just give – the player sixty thousand dollars a year, on top of their scholarship, or seventy thousand. I don't think there's going to be as much complaining because right now I think with their stipend they get about thirty thousand a year. Just double okay. it. Okay. You know what I mean? Now would that be for every athlete, every sport, or would it just be specifically for and basketball and, and football? Okay. 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 I know. I'm gonna. There's a thought I have here because I know some some schools don't have full scholarships for. Every single sport, like I think, I think Ivy League schools don't have athletic scholarships. They have scholarships for academics. Would it be? Would you use that same rule there for those individuals that don't have the athletic scholarship to where it's like sixty thousand doubling your stipend, whatever it is, for those athletes as well, even though they're not getting the athletic money towards them paying for school? Man, that's a tough one. That's a this tough. Is, this one. Is, see, this is stuff I think about that's all the time. I would, I would try to incorporate the Ivy League schools as well, okay. would, just because you know they are generating money to the university, and I, yeah. I think the NCA has the power to do that. Personally, I, I, I think they, they can do that. I think right now, I think to ask any adult, you know, with the demands of being a student athlete to live off thirty thousand dollars a year, I think is just not, not sustainable. Right. It's like. And I forgot to mention, I think they should pay for the housing and then get the 60000 as well. Like, to have 60000 just to have. You know what I mean? You know, so I, I was always under the impression, now this is just my little knowledge that I just don't know. I was under the impression that the housing was taken care of, but then I realized that housing is not. And so that puts a different twist on the cost of attendance stipend. I'm like, oh, these like 1000 1200 whatever the amount of, mo amount of money is they get. That is that's not that's not really spending money. That's money that's going towards stuff you have to pay. Exactly, exactly. And it's worth they they stop paying you in the summer too. Ooh. And so in the summertime, you're kind of on your own. So it's only for and then they're they're made they give you one check for the at least this is when I was in college. They give you one check for the summer to live off of. And that's like for three months and you're in summer school for, you know, six to eight weeks, depending, you know, how long the quarter semester is, you know, you're going to practices, you're going to class, like nothing really changes. Yeah. But you still only get that one check for two, three months. And it's less, I think it's even less than like a normal monthly check. So it's like, I think, I think they, they, they could compensate. I just think like, I don't agree that like, there should be like uh, like a salary like based on like if you're a Duke player versus if mm -hmm. you're a Duquesne mm -hmm. player. Mm -hmm. Like if Duke players make the, like I think everybody should make the same. Mm -hmm. And then what will happen is because of the NIL deals, then you'll see certain players from certain teams make more. So I think you could just give like a base salary to these student athletes, 67000 I don't think anybody would complain. I don't think I don't I think all the complaints would stop. And they had the the money to do it. Right. Right. Got to going to go through a little um four quick questions really quickly. You can elaborate if you want to. Um some things about the Big 10. One you just mentioned NIL. 
when you are playing college basketball, if, what would be your ideal NIL deal that you could sign on day one? Man, I've never even thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've not even thought about that, man. Uh, probably food, honestly, because I, I love food. So I would, I would seek out a lot of restaurants. Okay. Any yeah, particular? I, I love Canes. Man, that's Raising good stuff, Canes. man. That's good stuff. So I, you know, I like I like the way they operate. You know, a lot of times when you go into a, a Raising Canes restaurant, it's clean, it's organized. Mm -hmm. So and it's one of my favorite uh, fast food joints. So I, that would probably be the first one that sticks out. The Big Ten coach that you hated to play against. Ooh, that's a great question. Oh, man. So many good ones out there. I know, man. Ooh, I would, the Big Ten coach. I would say, man. Ooh. You know, I didn't like playing against Iowa and Fran McCaffrey. I didn't like guarding them because they got the ball up the court so fast. Mm hmm. And then they would never stop moving. Like those uh, are in yes. such great shape. Mm -hmm. I don't know what their conditioning program is, but that I would say Fran McCaffrey's teams were really tough to play against because they got that ball up there. So like everybody talks about Michigan State pushing the ball. And I think like pushing the ball, Michigan State and I were on the same level. But then once they got into their sets, they just wouldn't stop moving. You know what I mean? Guys yeah. were cutting hard, screens, like a lot of motion action. And so then when you get on the offensive end, it was like you were gassed. Yeah. Yeah. So you got Raising Canes for NIL. Your coach that you hated to go against was Fran McCaffrey, Iowa Hawkeyes. The toughest opponent you played against. Now, I know your defense wasn't your thing, but your toughest opponent in the Big Ten. I got to go back to Iowa. Roy Devin Marble, without a question. Because he was older than me. He was... Stronger than me, taller than me, you know. And then, like, I felt like we always played Iowa twice a year a lot. So mm -hmm. I was always going up against them, you know, earlier on in my career. And, I, man, I remember one possession, man. Oh, man. Like, he he took the ball out and, like, I think I was – for some reason I was picking him up full court, which I wouldn't normally do. And literally he, like, backed me down – 94 feet. That's like Mark Only, Jackson style, style, bro. But not like Mark Jackson would back you down to run off. He backed me down from one end of the court <laughs> inside the bucket, bump me, finish the layup. And I was just like, man, that, that was a moment that was demoralizing because I was like, dude, this dude really just like backed me down the whole length of the course in a five-on-five -five basketball game. Not this ain't no one-on-one. Like that's something you see like in a one-on-one -on -one practice drill, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you need a bucket and you know you got somebody smaller on you, you just back them down. Like he literally just backed me down like body to body, boom, 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 all the way until I was under the basket. And he just it was like the easiest layup. And it was just like, oh man, how do you how do you even come back? That's one of those moments in the film session after the game the next day. Everyone's laughing at you like, bro, how do you let that happen? It's like, hey, man, I couldn't do anything. Like, I tried, but I couldn't do anything to stop him. Man, he was just – he was so tough. I, I feel like he was so underrated, man. Like, he he could score in every way. Like, yeah. he could hit threes. He could get to the basket. He had the mid-range, the post-up. Like, man, he was a tough, tough cover. And, and the thing – he was kind of the only guy – who, like, would just go at me, like, thinking I was a – knowing or thinking whatever you thought. I was a weaker defender, right? Like, I felt like a lot of other teams didn't really, like, exploit me as much. Yeah. Um, But he was the guy that kind of just he, – he picked me out and exploited me. Then last but not least, toughest arena in the Big Ten to play in? Ooh. Um, uh, I would say – Indiana, probably. Okay. Well, simply Indiana. all. Just because the the history, um, the fans are kind of like right on top of you. Yeah. It's so loud. You can't hear anything. Um, 
You know, one team that would surprise some people when I was there, at least, I don't know about now, I would doubt now, but when I was there, that was tough to Nebraska. When they had Siobhan Shields and yes. uh, Petaway, mm -hmm. that was a very tough place to play because that arena was brand new. They were a good team. Uh, I forgot the name of the coach, Tim. Uh, I can't remember his name, but. Oh, was it Tim Floyd? Not Tim Floyd. Not Tim Floyd. Uh, uh, dang, I'm. I'm tripping. I should know his name. But, you know, he, he played a fun brand of basketball. They played fast. They got up and down the court. I think they ended up uh, being a tournament team one of those years. But, like, when they like when that team was good, I mean, that place was rocking. I think it was Pinnacle Arena. Mm -hmm. so that, that was a tough place to play while I was there, while I was in the Big Ten as well. Trey, this, is, this has been fun. Maybe we got more stuff to get to, but maybe we'll have to have you on it another time down the road. Uh, if you could, I always like to let guests, former players or broadcast members, uh, just leave a final thought. Maybe may it be about your playing career. May it be about being an analyst now. May it be about just home life, family life, things like that. What's a final thought you, like, you would like to leave the listeners today? Yeah, I mean, I think being an analyst now is something that definitely would probably pop into my mind first. Um I would say, you know, I, I've just enjoyed the process thus far. I'm new. You know, it, it comes fast. You know, you learn something new every day. Um, but I, I, the thing that, that I've enjoyed the most, man, is just how much uh, similar it is to playing. You know, you have mm -hmm. to prepare the same way. You know, you have to uh, watch film. You have to know the players. You have to, like, there's just so many uh, similar elements to playing as being an analyst. And, man, I, I'm just grateful for the Big Ten Network giving me the opportunity, um, you know, coming in late, you know, giving me an audition and uh, getting some, uh, some good studio time. So I, I got to give a shout out to the Big Ten Network. Good people over there. And I've seen you, like I told you, off air, I've seen you. It was on Wednesday night, just last, well, Tuesday night, just last night, and you did a phenomenal, yeah. phenomenal job with that. So I'll be looking out for you there on the Big Ten Network. Maybe we can cross paths again on Locked On Buckeyes. But for the Jay Stevens podcast, man, this has been fun. We'll definitely have you back on because uh, we got a lot more to talk about, especially playing overseas. Trey Dems, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you, man. I appreciate you having me.